Welcome to the Enchanted Library, where we turn the pages of books, beautiful and old, living and magical. It's time to curl up, get cozy, and join us on an adventure. Today we're reading from A Wonder Book by Nathaniel Hawthorne, The Miraculous Pitcher. By this time, Philemon and his two guests had reached the cottage door. "'Friends,' said the old man, "'sit down and rest yourselves here on this bench. My good wife, Boshes, has gone to see what you can have for supper. We are poor folks, but you shall be welcome to whatever we have in the cupboard.' The young stranger threw himself carelessly on the bench, letting his staff fall as he did so. And here happened something rather marvelous, though trifling enough, too. The staff seemed to get up from the ground of its own accord, and spreading its little pair of wings, it half hopped, half flew, and leaned itself against the wall of the cottage. There it stood quite still, except that the snakes continued to wriggle. But in my private opinion, old Philemon's eyesight had been playing him tricks again. Before he could ask any questions, the elder stranger drew his attention from the wonderful staff by speaking to him. "'Was there not?' asked the stranger, in a remarkably deep tone of voice. "'A lake in very ancient times covering the spot where now stands yonder village?' "'Not in my day, friend,' answered Philemon. "'And yet I am an old man, as you see. There were always the fields and meadows, just as they are now.' and the old trees, and the little stream murmuring through the midst of the valley. My father, nor his father before him, ever saw it otherwise, far as I know, and doubtless it will still be the same when old Philemon shall be good and forgotten. That is more than can be safely foretold, observed the stranger, and there was something very stern in his deep voice. He shook his head, too, so that his dark and heavy curls were shaken with the movement, since the inhabitants of yonder village have forgotten the affections and sympathies of their nature, it were better that the lake should be rippling over their dwellings again. The traveler looked so stern that Philemon was really almost frightened, the more so that at his frown the twilight seemed suddenly to grow darker, and that when he shook his head there was a roll as of thunder in the air. But in a moment afterward, the stranger's face became so kindly and mild that the old man quite forgot his terror. Nevertheless, he could not help feeling that this elder traveler must be no ordinary personage, though he happened now to be attired so humbly and to be journeying on foot. Not that Philemon fancied him a prince in disguise or any character of that sort, but rather some exceedingly wise man who went about the world in this poor garb despising wealth and all worldly objects, and seeking everywhere to add a mite to his wisdom. This idea appeared more probable, because, when Philemon raised his eyes to the stranger's face, he seemed to see more thought there than in one look than he could have studied out in a lifetime. While Boschus was getting the supper, the travelers both began to talk very sociably with Philemon. The younger, indeed, was extremely loquacious, and made such shrewd and witty remarks that the good old man continually burst out a-laughing, and pronounced him the merriest fellow whom he had seen for many a day. "'Pray, my friend,' he said, as they grew familiar together, "'what may I call your name?' "'Why, I am very nimble, as you see,' answered the traveller. "'So if you call me Quicksilver, the name will fit tolerably well.' "'Quicksilver? Quicksilver?' repeated Philemon looking in the traveller's face to see if he was making fun of him. That is a very odd name. And your companion there? Has he a strange of one? You must ask the thunder to tell it you, replied Quicksilver, putting on a mysterious look. No other voice is loud enough. This remark, whether it were serious or in jest, might have caused Philemon to conceive a great, very great awe of the elder stranger, if, on venturing to gaze at him, he had not beheld so much beneficence in his visage. But undoubtedly he was the grandest figure that had ever sat so humbly beside a cottage door. When the stranger conversed it was with gravity, and in such a way that Philemon felt irresistibly moved to tell him everything which he had most at heart. 
This is always a feeling that people have when they meet with anyone wise enough to comprehend all their good and evil, and to despise not a tittle of it. But Philemon, simple and kind-hearted old man that he was, had not many secrets to disclose. He talked, however, about the events of his past life, in the whole course of which he had never been more than a score of miles from this very spot. His wife, Boschus, and himself had dwelt in the cottage from their youth upward, earning their bread by honest labor, always poor, but still contented. He told what excellent butter and cheese Boschus made, and how nice were the vegetables which he raised in his garden. He said, too, that because they loved each other so very much, it was the wish of both that death might not separate them, but they should die, as they lived, together. As the stranger listened, a smile beamed over his countenance, and made its expression as sweet as it was grand. "'You are a good old man,' he said to Philemon, "'and you have a good old wife to be your helpmeet. It is fit that your wish be granted.' And it seemed to Philemon just then that as the sunset clouds threw up a bright flash from the west and kindled a sudden light in the sky. Boschus had now gotten her supper ready, and coming to the door began to make apologies for the poor fare which she was forced to set before her guests. "'Had we known you were coming,' said she, "'my good man and myself would have gone without a morsel, rather than you should lack a better supper. But I took most of part of today's milk to make cheese, and our last loaf is already half eaten. Ah, me, I feel, never feel the sorrow of being poor, save when a poor traveller knocks at our door. All will be very well. Do not trouble yourself, my good dame, replied the elder stranger kindly. An honest, hearty welcome to a guest works miracles with the fair, and is capable of turning the coarsest food to nectar and ambrosia. "'A welcome you shall have,' cried Boschus, "'and likewise a little honey we happen to have left, "'and a bunch of purple grapes besides.' "'Why, Mother Boschus, it is a feast!' exclaimed Quicksilver, laughing. "'An absolute feast! "'And you shall see how bravely I will play my part at it. "'I think I never felt hungrier in my life.' "'Mercy on us!' whispered Boschus to her husband. "'If the young man has such a terrible appetite, "'I'm afraid there will but not be half enough supper.' They all went into the cottage. And now, my little auditors, shall I tell you something that'll make you open your eyes very wide? It is really one of the oddest circumstances in the whole story. Quicksilver's staff, you recollect, had set itself up against the wall of the cottage. Well, when its master entered the door, leaving this wonderful staff behind, what should it do but immediately spread its little wings and go hopping and fluttering up the doorsteps? Tap-tap went the staff on the kitchen floor, nor did it rest until it had stood itself on end, with the greatest gravity and decorum, besides Quicksilver's chair. Old Philemon, however, as well as his wife, was so taken up in attending to their guests that no notice was given what to what the staff had been about. As Boschus had said, there was but a scanty supper for two hungry travelers. In the middle of the table was the remnant of a brown loaf, with a piece of cheese on one side of it, and a dish of honeycomb on the other. There was a pretty good bunch of grapes for each of the guests. A moderately sized earthen pitcher, nearly full of milk, stood at a corner of the board, and when Boschus had filled two bowls and set them before the strangers, only a little milk remained in the bottom of the pitcher. Alas, it is a very sad business when a bountiful heart finds itself pinched and squeezed among narrow circumstances— Poor Bacchus kept wishing that she might starve for a week to come if it were possible, by so doing to provide these hungry folks a more plentiful supper. And since the supper was so exceedingly small, she could not help wishing that their appetites had not been quite so large. Why, at their very first sitting down, the travelers both drank off all the milk in their bowls at a draught. "'A little more milk, kind Mother Boschus, if you please.' said Quicksilver. The day has been hot, and I am very much athirst. Oh, now, my dear people, answered Bossius in great confusion, I am so sorry and ashamed, but the truth is, there is hardly a drop more milk in the pitcher. Oh, husband, husband, why didn't we go without our supper? Why, it appears to me, cried Quicksilver, starting up from the table and taking the pitcher by the handle, it really appears to me that matters are not quite so bad as you represent them. Here is certainly more milk in the pitcher. So saying, and to the vast astonishment of Bacchus, he proceeded to fill not only his bowl, but his companions likewise, from the pitcher, 
that was supposed to be almost empty. The good woman could scarcely believe her eyes. She had certainly poured out nearly all the milk, and had peeped in afterward, and seen the bottom of the pitcher as she set it down on the table. "'But I am old,' thought Boshes to herself, and apt to be forgetful. "'I suppose I have made a mistake. At all events, the pitcher cannot help being empty now, after filling the bowls twice over.' "'What excellent milk!' observed Quicksilver, after quaffing the contents of the second bowl. "'Excuse me, my kind hostess, but I really must ask you for a little more.' Now, Boshes had seen, as plainly as she could see anything, that Quicksilver had turned the pitcher upside down, and consequently had poured out every drop of milk in filling the last bowl. Of course, there could not possibly be any left. However, in order to let him know how precisely the case was— she lifted the pitcher and made a gesture as if pouring milk into Quicksilver's bowl, but without the remotest idea that any milk would stream forth. What was her surprise, therefore, when such an abundant cascade fell bubbling into the bowl that it was immediately filled to the brim and overflowed upon the table? The two snakes that were twisted about Quicksilver's staff, but neither Boshes nor Philemon happened to observe the circumstance, stretched out their heads and began to lap up the spilt milk. And then, what a delicious fragrance the milk had! It seemed as if Philemon's only cow must have pastured that day on the richest herbage that could be found anywhere in the world. I only wish that each of you, my beloved little souls, could have a bowl of such nice milk at supper time. And now a slice of your brown loaf, Mother Boshes, said Quicksilver, and a little of that hummy. Boshes cut him a slice accordingly. And though the loaf, when she and her husband ate of it, had been rather too dry and crusty to be palatable, it was now as light and moist as if only a few hours out of the oven. Tasting a crumb, which had fallen on the table, she found it more delicious than bread ever was before, and could hardly believe it was a loaf of her own kneading and baking. Yet what other loaf could it possibly be? But, oh, the honey— I may as well just let it alone, without trying to describe how exquisitely it smelt and looked. Its color was that of purest and most transparent gold, and it had the odor of a thousand flowers, but of such flowers as never grew in an earthly garden, and to seek which the bees must have flown high among the clouds. The wonder is that, after alighting on a flower bed of so delicious fragrance and immortal bloom, they should have been content to fly down again to their hive in Philemon's garden— Never was such honey tasted, seen, or smelt. The perfume floated around the kitchen and made it so delightful that had you closed your eyes, you would instantly have forgotten the low ceiling and smoky walls and fancied yourself in an arbor with celestial honeysuckles creeping over it. Thank you for joining us today. If you enjoyed today's episode, please leave a review on your favorite podcast platform and share our podcast with a friend. Visit our website at www.enchantedlibrary.net to see our past books or to connect with us on Facebook. If you'd like to support the work we do, you can visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash enchantedlibrary. We appreciate your support. Until next time, friends, happy reading.